Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome, or possibly welcome back to Salone SRI. Um, I'm Tony Hay, the co-founder and joint managing director of ResponsibleInvestor.com, and it's my great pleasure today to be moderating this session, which is going to focus on ESG tools, looking at SRI and ESG and fund manager selection um, and research. So um, I'm going to briefly frame the tap panel, but before I do that, I'm going to start just by asking each of the three panelists to briefly introduce yourselves. I'll just say who you are first and then I'll call you in. So from Concert, we have Angela DeWolf, um, who's the managing partner there. At Sycamore Asset Management, we have Sabrina Ritosa Fernandez who is an ESG analyst. And from Aviva Investors, we have Maxime Maricom, who is a senior multi-asset and multi-management analyst. So briefly, Angela, would you just like to say hello to the audience and introduce yourself? Thank you, Tony. Yes, hello to everybody. I'm very happy and pleased to be uh, on this panel today. Um, in a few words, I'm an expert in 20 years in ESG and sustainable investing. And through uh, the company we founded um, 17, uh, 13 years ago, Concert, we are just supporting and advising institutional investor in defining, implementing, and verifying the uh, sustainable investment uh, approaches. Thank you. Happy to share. Thank you very much, um, Angela. So I'll now move to um, Sabrina for a brief introduction. Thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. Very pleased to be here, although I hope next year we'll be in person. So on my side, I work in Sycamore uh, IM Portfolio Management Team as a ESG Specialist, and I'm especially in charge of the S of ESG, so Human Rights, Human Capital, and I also work on Responsible Technology. Besides, I also lead Sycamore efforts on their internal CSR and the implementation of their mission. So looking forward to discuss with you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. And then on to Maxime. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored uh, to be part of this uh, panel with such good speakers uh, and uh, to share with uh, you uh, as inter Italian investors. Um, I'm working at Aviva Investors, uh, been selecting fund for the last five years. Uh, in a global multi-management team of seven people. I'm based in Paris, so I'm locked down in Paris uh, and uh, focused on the ESG fund selection. Uh, I'm also managing a SRI fund of fund. Great, thank you very much, Maxime. So before the panelists start, um, I'm just gonna start and briefly try and frame where I think this panel can go, or at least what the problems are. Um, perhaps a, a key problem was um, highlighted yesterday in response from investors' uh, main headline, EU policymakers accused of picking and choosing when to use science and new taxonomy rules. And it seems that um, everybody has a different opinion as to which direction we should be going in um, and how um, data should be framed and how funds data should be framed. Um, if you are in the audience and you didn't listen to the 10 o'clock session today, Transparency of ESG Investment Products. I would really recommend that you do listen to it. Um, if you didn't, you know, get, get, get onto that live recording. Um, without wanting to pick on any of the panelists, they were very good panelists, and nobody said or did anything wrong, but we had a discussion of global investment performance standards, which is the accounting version of um, how you might look at a fund. We then had a discussion around intentionality, outcomes, impact and additionalities, which I think might fry some people's brains even more than the idea of global investment performance standards. Um, we had a, an interesting comment on the sustainable finance disclosure regulation, uh, which was framed as being good because it requires compliance. Uh, but at the same time, um, um, Adri Heinsbrook from NNIP, who was talking about that, um, said that one of the problems with the um, SF um, DR is that it creates parity between leaders and laggards. So it allows the laggards to kind of hide um, behind um, a cloak of, of disclosure, if you like. Um, and for anybody who enjoys the differences between nationalities, listening to Adri um, describing Dutch people not as rude, but as impolitely friendly is well worth listening to. Um, so there appears to be no set of agreed KPIs to rate an investment management firm um, or any of the fund products um, as being responsible, green, sustainable, impact, ESG. There's, there's a plethora of standards and views. 
Um, from now on, I'm just going to talk about responsible to cover all those terms. Um, there's a number of organizations that produce responsible fund ratings, but um, those ratings are not universally accepted and are regarded by many as contentious. Um, and the ratings are not always rigorous, uh, which is obviously why they are contentious. And that leads many people to charge the investment industry with greenwashing. We've heard the name, the term greenwashing used a number of times today, and it's going to become problematic more and more. So whether the greenwashing itself is intentional or otherwise, I think um, is irrelevant. If the veracity of a responsible fund can be reasonably challenged by anybody with a contrary opinion, then the methodology is clearly unfit for purpose. Um, and the reality is that the bar has been set far too low so far and the methodologies applied are far too lax. And there are people out there that charge the industry in saying that um, it's very relaxed about the bar being set so low because it maximizes the number of investment funds that can be labeled as responsible. And if that's true, then the accusation of greenwashing um, is justified and is going to stick. Um, so having set out my stall, as it were, that I think that um, if you compare global investment performance standards or something very specific like total expense ratios um, to what we're talking about when we talk about ESG fund ratings, ESG fund ratings look um, extremely woolly um, in comparison. So the running order is going to be, and we'll start with uh, Maxime Ricom from Aviva Investors. We'll then move on to Sabrina uh, Rutosa Fernandez from Sycamore Asset Management, um, and then Angela De Wolf from Concert. So I will call now on Maxime to give his presentation. Thank you, uh, Tony, for this uh, brilliant uh, introduction. Uh, we, we agree uh, that uh, there are a lot of works when uh, selecting ESG or SRI funds. Uh, and what we uh, try to do uh, first is to uh, see how our traditional approach can uh, already uh, uh, add some value in selecting funds. Uh, and a traditional approach is quantitative screening and then qualitative assessment. Uh, and ESG in this sense is not a revolution, it's kind of an evolution and within the entire methodology we uh, had some uh, ESG uh, point. From the quantitative uh, research standpoint, uh, you, you mentioned it, uh, there are many providers, uh, different data points. Uh, we start with Morningstar, for instance, uh, a, key, uh, a key data provider for us, basing uh, its ESG metrics on Sustainalytics and having uh, a final output that could be globes uh, like they have stars. Um, we also use Quantalis uh, for uh, another reason. They have a data point on the label of the fund. Uh, I will uh, detail a little regarding label and I know uh, Sabrina will, uh, will discuss that in detail, but um, we, uh, we, we look at uh, this uh, too. And at the end, uh, also from a quantitative standpoint, we use MSCI ESG research, uh, implementing uh, some uh, uh, internal metrics based on the holdings we uh, receive from the different uh, fund uh, managers we uh, talk to. Uh, all in all, many data are self-reported, not necessarily audited. Uh, there are discrepancies you, you mentioned. So what is crucial uh, as for the financial data is to uh, assess the quality of the data and uh, have a qualitative approach uh, to uh, see uh, what we can, uh, how we can trust the, the fund managers and uh, avoid uh, greenwashing as much as possible. So from the qualitative standpoint, Again, uh, we use our method, our traditional method of analyzing with the seven P's. And within all those seven pillars, we add some ESG uh, consideration. Uh, first P is for parents. So in the parent company, when we look at the promoter, we look at uh, are they signatory of the PRI? Uh, what is the board diversity? Uh, what is the board independence? Uh, things like this. Regarding the product, we see, uh, is there any exclusion list? How uh, extensive is this uh, exclusion list? Is there a label to the fund? Uh, how comfortable are we with the label? The, the third P is people. And again, we look at the ESG team as we would look at the PM or analyst team and how do uh, they, uh, they fit with the, the rest of the team in terms of size, in terms of experience. Then we look at the philosophy and the process uh, of the managers. Is the 
philosophy kind of impact or just integrating ESG or do they just do ESG uh, for uh, because it's in fashion, let's say? And then in the process, we all also uh, scrutinize how they implement ESG. Is that qualitative, quantitative? When does that come uh, in the investment decision? And uh, at the end of the process and checking all of that, we look at the positions of the, the fund and the, the performance. So the position, it, can we see an ESG footprint within the position of the fund uh, relative to what was mentioned in the previous uh, parts? And in terms of performance, do we see correlation with uh, indices that could be uh, SRI indices or ESG uh, indices? and uh, seeing uh, how the, the, the correlation is between the, the fund and, uh, <clears throat> and the, the index. So it mix of quantitative and qualitative. Uh, just a quick comment regarding the label. Labels are easy for uh, us to identify quickly a, a fund, positioning a fund in the universe. There are more than 15,000 funds, so it's uh, uh, easy. But uh, as, as you mentioned, there are many of them and those labels are as good as the oversight attached to it. So again, we uh, need to uh, make sure that we have the right qualitative assessment on the fund and on the, the label uh, quality. And does this label fits with the, 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 the philosophy we want to, uh, to implement in our fund of fund? And you, you mentioned the SFDR um, that is uh, supposed to, uh, to, to be uh, implemented in March uh, 2021. And as fund selectors, we look at this regulation as uh, something that will help us to um, <clears throat> reduce again the universe, screen from a quantitative standpoint the universe with Article 8 uh, ESG SRI funds and Article 9 funds with impact. So already trying to clarify uh, the, the universe, having a unique language and maybe reducing uh, um, this type of greenwashing, but also uh, discrepancy between methodologies and having a, a, a similar uh, language. Thank you on mute, Tony. Thank you very much. I'm breaking my own rules. Isn't it terrible when even the moderator doesn't know how to use a computer? Um, maybe I'll just take you back and ask you a question before we move on. Um, you are in a position where you you have to, you're forced to, or, or you perhaps want to look at multiple data sets. Um, and then effectively from there, you're conducting proprietary research. Now, how does that work at the retail level? I don't know how familiar you are with the retail level, but if I am buying funds from a funds platform and I see some stars or ratings or other form of, of um, you know, giving a credit to a fund, I don't have the time to go to multiple sets of data or conduct the 7P style of proprietary research. Do, do you have thoughts or, or advice for people who have to do that kind of thing themselves? Well, I think that uh, Morningstar Globes, uh, as Morningstar Stars, uh, have uh, some uh, good, uh, good, good. Um, how to say that? Uh, well, can be good to uh, quickly decide. Uh, but uh, of course, there are uh, universe like the emerging markets where uh, the average of the ESG scores of the managers is lower than on other uh, parts. So this, uh, this can be uh, kind of confusing, but overall, uh, this, uh, this methodology is uh, something that uh, can help uh, to uh, quickly decide when you are retail investors. And labels uh, that I mentioned can also uh, help. Uh, and maybe there is more uh, distinction between uh, some generalist labels like the SRI label, the Lux flag label, or the uh, ex fable fin uh, towards sustainability label. And if you are more regarding uh, climate, uh, you can uh, take a look at uh, Lux Flag uh, climate uh, finance, or if uh, or the, the Greenfin label. So you have different uh, offers to uh, to help you in quickly uh, identifying and positioning a product. But uh, again, uh, the standardization uh, wished by the European Union will help to uh, clarify 
and uh, uh, put a summary of all those approaches and labels, uh, helping both professional investors that can make uh, qualitative due diligence, but also retail investors to uh, navigate this uh, universe. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, we're going to move on to um, Sabrina, who um, at Sycamore Asset Management, no doubt, enjoys um, having all of these labels applied to the products that they uh, create and sell. Um, I'd be interested to see what she has to say about that. Over to you, Sabrina. Sure, thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Maxine, for the very interesting insights. So I definitely agree that the responsible investing space is getting crowded, really crowded which is a good thing for sure. But at the same time, as money managers, we have a great deal of freedom today in the way each one of us does responsible investment. And so I, I really, uh, I understand that uh, understanding the differences can get overwhelming for the final customer. So for us at Sycomore, the starting point, first of all, needs to be at the organizational level, meaning really we need to embed responsible investment in the strategy and in the company identity. So for instance, uh, what we have done here is that we have formalized uh, our mission related to supporting a sustainable and inclusive economy in our articles of incorporations. And we have a whole organization in place to make sure that we apply to ourselves what we ask companies to do in our engagements. As we think really that this can be bring us more legitimacy in the way we also engage with companies. Because as we're engaging every day with companies, we tell them what to do. First of all, we also need to lead by example. So this is really important for us. And this has led us to become a B Corp. So as we're talking about labels, this is not a, a label at fund level. This is a, a label at company level, but uh, at company level. But we think it's really important to make sure that first of all, we're audited on our practices as a company to give a further signal of trust and commitment uh, to responsible investment to our co customers and to our final investors, and also to the companies, of course, that we engage with. So this is at organizational level, which means also that everyone in the organization, not just the portfolio management team, feels involved with our mission related to responsible investment. And this is really the starting point and a sine qua non condition. And then, of course, we go into the investment team. And so the investment team, as everybody knows, it's really important to make sure that the team is fully integrated. This is the first sign of, of real integration, real embeddedness of responsible investment. So uh, on our side, in a portfolio management team of 23 people, we have nine specialized in ESG. This doesn't mean that we do only ESG, as most of us are also financial analysts and specialized in uh, ESG, certain ESG issues or thematics. But um, <clears throat> it's very, because it, it's really important that we have specialists on ESG as certain issues are extremely complex. So for instance, on my side, I'm the specialist on human rights, uh, on social issues and on responsible technology. And I'm embedded in the investment team of the two funds dedicated to this. So Sycomore Happy at Work and the Sycomore Sustainable Tech. And so um, beyond this integration of the team, which must be, uh, I think, the rule today. Um, we also incentivize everyone to do ESG analysis and also especially to do engagement. And it's very important to get traditional financial PMs on board with engagement. And I really want to share with you um, a story. One year ago, um, we were we invited investor relations people from, uh, from different companies to Sycamore to talk about gender diversity. And one company raised their hands and they said, okay, it's very nice. We're all talking about gender diversity, but I swear to you, never, never has any traditional financial analyst or any PM asked any question uh, about gender diversity to our CEO. So he doesn't think it's an issue. So this is why it's really important that everyone in the team uh, does engagement, does ESG analysis and so on. And so another point that was uh, mentioned by Maxime is the difficulty uh, to understand ratings and to choose the, the most appropriate ratings. And I, I really uh, I really can, can empathize with that. So for us, actually, to the point that uh, we have our own proprietary methodology, we use no external rating provider because we think that unfortunately today rating providers are quite biased towards um, the companies that disclose the most, which means the more you disclose, the better your rating. But often those that disclose the most are not necessarily those uh, that are more responsible, are just those with the most resources. Um, so of course we do look at external research and we don't wanna be 100% self-referential, but 
Uh, we think it's important to do our own work also because we have a double materiality matrix. So, of course, we have the financial materiality point of view, but also it's important to look at the impact on stakeholders, no matter the, the, the financial, the level of financial materialities, because sometimes human rights issues, social issues, they take really time to materialize, but it doesn't mean that we don't have to take them into account. And so to go really further and to really try to understand the impacts of companies, we decided to go a bit our own way in the beginning and work with the academics and external consultants and develop our own metrics, like the NEC, Net Environmental Contribution, which is our environmental impact metric that now we are sharing in open source to encourage its usage and the continuous research around it and make it transparent and accessible. Um, and so finally, we also think that to judge uh, the real and badness of ESG uh, research and the ESG ratings and make sure that the, the asset manager is taking seriously the ratings that it's issuing, uh, the ratings, they should ha have an impact and an influence on valuation. And this is really at the basis of our approach. And so finally, another point uh, that was touched by, by Maxime is that in this responsible investing jungle, uh, if we can call it like this, so transparency and pedagogy are, are really key, especially for the final customer. And so we really try to make an effort on this, of course, on our side, but we think what we really should be uh, transparent um, about as an asset manager is the actual companies we choose and why we choose them. And those we avoid and why we avoid them and which kind of discussions we have and how we vote as well at IGMs. So I think this is what our communications should focus on, not much maybe the ratings themselves, the processes, but really try to talk about the issues. Um, and so this is because this is what responsible investing is about. It's about financing certain companies, supporting a certain type of economy rather than another type and encouraging best practices. Even though I must be honest, this uh, puts us sometimes in uncomfortable situation. As everyone we know, <laughs> as ESG practitioner, everyone has their vision on ESG. I mean, your neighbor, your mom, your dad, your client, everyone has their say. For example, uh, um, Danone is an interesting example of this. For some, it's a, clearly a leader in terms of responsible practices. And for others, there's no reason, there's no justification for having Danone in a responsible fund because of animal protein and, and other issues. So it, it's hard, but it, it must be done. And so finally, the, the last point uh, touched by Maxime was about uh, labels. And uh, we, we think we have most of them for our funds because we do think that it helps to the final investor to signal a certain robustness of the approach. And it's, it helps to comfort on the fact that what we say is what is actually being done in terms of processes. But not all labels, as, as Maxine said again, are equal and not all of them guarantee 100% uh, that a fund is in line with certain values. So the franchise that I label, to give you an example, it only judges that the process is respected. Whereas you have other labels like the Belgian towards sustainability or the Austrian one that gives you some exclusions as well, like uh, for coal or tobacco, which is another level of commitment. And also, by the way, their design, they challenge a bit more the, the portfolio manager when they're doing the audit. So it's another level of commitment. And then um, you have also specialized one like the green fin one, which is that one is really a pure green, green label. So it also really uh, not all, the message here is not all labels are equal and they don't necessarily signal a really virtuous fund as it's, it's in the end, it's up to the, to the portfolio manager to decide how to implement uh, their own process. Um, and, so, and, and so I hope as a conclusion, maybe I hope that the labels will go more in the direction of focusing more on outcomes rather than their processes, because I think this is what really responsible investing is about. So this is, for, uh, this is it for me and over to you, Tony. Thank you very much indeed, Sabrina. That's, that's a very interestingly well-made point at the end there um, about um, processes and outcomes. But if I can take you back just, just a moment, um, and you know, I, I, I saw a presentation yesterday about the, the Money Mate um, funds universe that they have, and I'm relatively familiar with the Morningstar funds universe. You were talking about the um, additional um, research that your portfolio managers do into companies before making decisions. But it strikes me that the fund ratings that are produced by the, the big agencies that, that produce them um, can't possibly reflect that. 
that, that it's very black and white from their point of view. They see that you're invested in a particular company, they rate it in a particular way, that then gets applied to the rating of your fund. They're not able to look any further. I, I suspect they don't look at process. I suspect they don't look at company level information or the investment team. W would you agree with that? Um, so, so sorry, just I'm not sure I get your point. So your point is, the, I think the point the, is the, the screening doesn't really get the the so, cost. So, right? Sorry, the point I'm trying to make. I'll, I'll pick on Morningstar, but there's no particular reason. Um, they're the same as anybody else. They, they look at the holdings in your portfolio. Um, they're using data supplied by Sustainalytics, and Sustainalytics yeah. has ratings for each of those companies. And therefore, they then give you um, one, two, three, four, or five globes, depending on the ratings of the companies. But they're not able, as far as I know, to look more deeply at your investment team, the processes that they have, or your company level information. So, so uh, yeah, I see. No, I'm not an expert on, on Morningstar methodology and so on, but I know sometimes it really doesn't match. Uh, often it doesn't match our vision of our funds because, for example, I know that the bias we have towards small companies, it's actually penalized, for example, by Morningstar because small companies disclose less. This means they have less ratings. This means that overall our fund is going gonna, is gonna to come out as, as less good than others. Um, so this is what I know. I think also in terms of how we work and the engagement we do and so on, all this is qualitative information that doesn't feed into the final picture. Um, so I, of course, for us, it's, it's we're not always very happy with the with the outcome on Morningstar because we don't think it really reflects the, the added value that we put into the fund, and we think especially small companies should be supported by a responsible investor. It's important not to outshine them. So it's a pity that we are penalized for that and for doing our own research and going deep into uh, having meetings with them, doing engagement with them, following them year over year. Um, so, of course, and, and this is why, I mean, we go back to my point, my previous point, this is why we did our own uh, proprietary methodology, which is based on the stakeholders of a company, it's called SPICE, um, to be able to, to have, um, to do our own research and not to be biased towards large gaps and, and, uh, and have this kind of biases. Brilliant. Okay, th thank you, Sabrina. Uh, since we've been name checking Morningstar, it's worth saying that um, other fundraising agencies are available to be criticised if that's what you want to do. So um, I'm now going to uh, move on to um, Angela. Um, if I could call you on to give your, your presentation and make your comments, please. Great. Yes, thank you. And I think the, the introduction is perfect. You, what Sabrina said and Maxime has presented is really to the point. Um, Indeed, we are um, uh, at Concert, we are serving, we are supporting asset owner getting in this space of sustainable investing. And indeed, there is a dilemma. We are so happy to see that this sustainable investment is becoming mainstream, also because of some pressure, but uh, it, it's now becoming really a priority also for larger institutional investors. But having it said, that, said that and coming to Sabrina's point, uh, there is some issue uh, today to the fact that um, there is no uh, agreement or final agreement on what is ESG at the end. There is a rich diversity of opinions among experts, and this expert at the rating agency, but as Sabrina said, a lot of knowledge, a lot of wisdom is also at the level of active uh, asset manager. And this brings, of course, a certain ESG complexity and a divergence of views. Um, this is a richness, but it's also a challenge. And the challenge becomes at two levels. It is at the level of asset manager, as said before, because the active, long-term, credible asset manager need to build the ESG credibility. They need to show how much they are different and how much they are better than the other one. So there is a pressure to react. There is a pressure to adapt quickly. This is for asset manager. It's very hard for them to differentiate from competition. How do you show that your property approach is different if you are just uh, rated by a one single source? And you are lost in this landfill of new funds. Just remember that uh, from the beginning of this year, there will be more than 300 new funds in 2020 only. So the challenge is to enhance this active profile, this research, this added value. 
But uh, for us that we are also advising asset owners, uh, you have to imagine that they don't have the large expertise that you can find at Aviva, for example. So they, they really are uh, put into increased pressure from regulation to adopt ESG, but they are lacking expertise. They have so many uh, other aspects. So pension funds, foundation, need to go to sustainable investment, but fundamentally they don't have the tool or internal expertise to really do it in a professional way. And they get over solicited from manager coming and say, my fund is the best when on sustainability, my fund is the best on climate change, I'm doing to be low carbon funds, I'm an impact fund. So this over solicitation brings them on the, on the, on the product uh, to be a reaction. And there is a fear of this brainwashing. How to discriminate? Uh, imagine that they only on 2020, more than 50 funds had been rebranded from a classical to an ESG. So uh, there is a constraint, there is a pressure, there is a, uh, also a constraint from cost uh, at, at the asset, on, asset owner level. So they are looking for simplicity. These consequences have a certain impact on this market. Uh, there is like a mistrust between asset owners, institutional investor, and asset manager. So this makes also the ESG adoption slow down, but there is also a risk in this dimension is for some of them to get to the quick and uh, simplistic um, solution. So you try to find out the best ETF, ESG ETF, in order to replace the classical one. And I think the market need needs to keep this diversity, needs also to have these multiple views, need to enhance what active manager, the internal research, the analysts are doing in terms of ESG. And there is also a need for clarity and comparability uh, with a neutral assessment. Uh, and this is a little bit the role um, being uh, an independent advisor, concert, being placed here in Geneva and around with Switzerland, it's our role we're trying to keep. It's to build this bridge, this trust between asset owner and asset manager. Try first to support asset owner to define what is sustainability for them. What do they mean? What do they want to, um, to exclude? What, how do they want to engage? But how much do they want to have an ESG integration? Is it at a high level or at a low level? How much they are looking for impact? And once the asset owners, the investor has defined what is sustainability, what it is its sensitivity, in that case, we can look at asset manager and define the ones that are compa compatible, compliant with the principle or the charter that the asset owner has defined. And to do so, uh, we have indeed developed also a tool that is based on the ESG consensus. And this tool is really about not just based on rating agency, because it's an average of, uh, I would say, rating from rating agency, but most of the most is based also on the added value from active um, uh, asset manager, ESG manager, that really brings this forward looking opinion on company and not just on the back uh, words uh, ratings. So this is an approach that uh, I think it's quite interesting and enriching uh, for both sides because they get to communicate better and it brings indeed some trust and it's support, I would say, asset owners finding out their way in this large universe and to asset manager to better explain what they are doing and what is it, uh, this added value. So you had to have, if I had just to summarize and to give a conclusion, for us, what is very important, it, it's to keep the smart diversity at the sustainability level, sustainable finance, but it's also to bring more transparency in order to build uh, this combination and this trust between these two major players in order to make sustainable investment a real mainstream approach. Great. Thank you very much indeed for that, Angela. Um, I'm going to make a couple of comments and then I'm going to ask a question and I'll, I'll start the question with uh, Maxime, just so you're aware. I'll, I'll go through in the same order that, that everyone spoke. Um, 
do you think that uh, I, I referenced total expense ratios and global investment performance standards earlier on? And if we could have um, some kind of KPI methodology that, that came close to the way people look at those, then um, we, we would have the holy grail. But do you think it's even possible to do that? Do you think there is too much opinion around what is environmental, social or governance um, to mean that we, we can ever get to that? Uh, and Angela, in fact, all of you who referenced transparency, transparency is about the best we can hope for, transparency and disclosure. Maxime, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, I, I wish uh, we can indeed to, uh, to aggregate and, uh, and find this uh, common language. Um, of course, uh, it's a lot of uh, lobbying uh, too uh, between uh, different stakeholders that would prefer their methodology to, uh, to apply at the European Union uh, uh, level. And uh, what we try to, uh, to push uh, as a, 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 an investment uh, manager and an actor is uh, of course uh, trying to, uh, to to figure out between the uh, different pillars. Uh, our key uh, pillars are uh, climate, which is uh, first and foremost uh, because we are also a, a subsidiary of an insurance company. So uh, climate risk uh, is uh, taken is taken very seriously at uh, all level of the of the company. Uh, it's uh, also people, um, and uh, we uh, we we want and try to uh, to. Uh, mm, um, investig uh, investigate and try to uh, have a more inclusive uh, society, uh, more diversity. Those two uh, topics are, are, are key uh, as the uh, hearse, uh, let's say it seems uh, very uh, uh, vanilla, but uh, hearse is also one of our, our, our pillars. And in terms of methodology, today we try to uh, navigate with different methodology. It has been mentioned that smaller caps or emerging markets are less uh, communicating data, so are less covered by SRI. So let, let's try to see how the industry can gather some information and have uh, an idea. Uh, the regulator can help by uh, trying to define uh, and, uh, and help us. But today, indeed, uh, we do not have that, and uh, it, uh, it forced us or it uh, improved our practice to uh, to go into details and how data are crunched and uh, what does that mean for the asset manager integrating uh, E, S and G pillars while for the equity space G was uh, obviously done by uh, all of them uh, 20 years uh, ago. Okay, but um, I'll, I'll move on to Sabrina. Do we, do we really think it's possible to get hard and fast opinions on if we take diversity as an example, diversity on boards, what percentages should be applied, um, the, the, the difference between male, female, um, racial diversity, diversity of background, diversity of education. Can anybody come up and agree with a formula that's going to be meaningful or do we have to just stick with proprietary research and, and opinion? That's, that's an interesting question because we just launched the 30% club here in France where we're asking companies to have at least 30% women on their, on their executive committees. Um, and I mean, 30% is an aspirational number, but it starts from the observation that um, the number of women in the workforce is, is above that. And, and so, and today the number of women in the executive committee is, is 20%. So I think first of all, in terms of gender diversity, for example, we should be able to close this gap between women in the workforce and women in leadership. There's no reason why if we have 50% women in the workforce, that are only at 20% of, of leaders, right? So I think this is how we are reasoning on many things. So on racial uh, equality is a bit similar. We also try to see what is the population in a country, this minority, what does it represent for this country? And then is it, are we above, below? Um, in terms of women engineers, how many women engineers get out of universities? For example, there are 30% of the total students. So this is the number we expect to see in a, in a technology company. So I think there are ways that, you know, when you put together sociology, politics, demographics on each topic, uh, when you try to dig a bit deeper, there are, there are standards and benchmarks we can try to aspire to as a society. And I think this is, I mean, in the end is at the spirit of what has been done with the SDGs. Um, and, and as Angela was saying, because in the end, what we need to do first is to also to define really what sustainability is, 
in terms of environment, in terms of um, you know social issues, diversity, inclusion, and so on, and then try to see uh, how do we go from there. What are the KPIs? What are the targets? Okay, so it seems to be coming back to the same point every yeah. time. How, how do we define what sustainability is um, and put a KPI around it? Um, Angela, do you think it's even possible? Um, what I think it's really important, I think we can reach a point where KPIs or specific data on E, on S and G can be standardized in the sense that any company can really publish following a standard like we have in financial. So you have to define the framework. That what does it mean? Uh, number of women in, on board or number of women on the executive. So this kind of data has to be standardized. But as in the financial field, when you come to ESG, you can have the similar KPIs for a, for a company, but at the end, reaching a different conclusion how, in the term of the judgment of the quality of the company that you consider being really sustainable. So I think we can reach a level of standard, but the conclusion on the quality of the company and the capacity to face the challenge on sustainability can differ from an, uh, an analyst to another analyst. And we have to face this dimension to have multiple views, but similar standard and a maximum of standardization in terms of, of disclosure. And this is where we have to work. It's similar as the financial analyst. I don't see the difference and I don't see what, why we are trying to get uh, of everything harmonized. But there is this difference to be keep in mind. And this is possible. Okay, so to, to my mind, following this logic through, and I'll, I'll take this question to Sabrina first, rather than um, agencies like Morningstar, MSCI, Refinitiv and, and the rest rating fund products, should they not be rating the investment management organizations themselves? And that's what people should be buying into, the asset manager, not necessarily the product. So if um, a particular asset manager, um, XYZ company has a very good ESG rating, then all of their products should be regarded as worth buying. Um, Sabrina? Yeah, sure. So I think that both come together, right? So an asset manager can be considered a good one. Also, if the product is it's not harmful to the environment, or to people and so on. So I think you cannot really separate the two. So I think on the contrary, so I think we should today integrate the way the asset manager is organized and so on in these ratings. So on this, I agree. But we should also um, try to go deep uh, and really try to, to, to go deep into the holdings, underlying holdings, uh, and really understand uh, what is the impact and the outcomes that we are having thanks to this, uh, to the activity of this asset management, asset manager in terms of which company he is choosing, but also in terms of engagement, for example. So this is also a really big part of what asset managers are doing, the engagement, the voting, which is largely overlooked today um, by external external rating uh, agencies. Um, and for example, I mean, I don't have the numbers, unfortunately, in mind, but I know that there are some big asset managers that are really going green and so on. And then when you look at the way they vote for environmental and social resolution at AGMs, they're totally against everything they're preaching in their communication. So this should be integrated in the conversation. So that, that, that comes back to the comment you made earlier on about process and outcomes, which is an interesting one. Um, but uh, Maxime, when you're looking and, and thinking about your seven Ps, um, it would be interesting to know how this filter works for you. When you're looking at investment management organizations, do you come across organizations, you don't have to name them, who have all the right processes from a sustainability point of view, and you would rate 10 out of 10 from a sustainability point of view, but then for some reason, their investments themselves turn out to be unsustainable. Do you, do you see that happening? Well, the, in the seven piece, the organization uh, is uh, one of the P uh, regarding the promoter. Uh, and uh, uh, what we look at uh, is uh, of course, uh, board, uh, board and uh, the shareholders, who is the shareholder, how is composed the board, uh, again, who are the leaders, the diversity in the leaders, uh, women to, to male, uh, but uh, also uh, broader diversity uh, consideration. 
And uh, the B Corp label that was mentioned uh, is something that we also uh, regard with a, a high, uh, high value for the, the firm itself, because it means that the entire organization is uh, considering a sustainable uh, approach. And then uh, we uh, try to look at, I think no one's perfect, neither on ESG uh, things or uh, on uh, financial, uh, traditional financial uh, asset management. But what we try to look is consistency in the approach, the resources that are put in place and uh, how does that fit with the current search we have? Because from time to time, we have uh, clients or a mandate or a fund that is uh, tilted toward climate uh, and uh, the Paris uh, agreement. Uh, so we look at this uh, pillar uh, with more weighting. And for others, it's just a, a, a good uh, average of the, the, the different pillars. Um, but all in all, um, what we... Uh, would like to uh, to see is this standardization with Article 8 and Article 9 that will help us from the pure product standpoint to classify easy, e easily the, the funds and uh, then we will continue to make an effort to, uh, to see how it fits with the mandate as for any investment the, this uh, suitability between what the client is looking for if we are the client what is our philosophy and what uh, what the fund the fund manager is proposing. Okay, thank you very much. We're marginally over time, so I'm going to leave um, the last word from the three of you, and it'll have to be almost one word. I'll, I'll give you a few more than that. Um, Angela, do you have any comments on this? Do you, do you yeah, see just, investment managers that are very good that have bad products and, and vice versa? Uh, what is interesting, we have screened, for example, 50 funds that consider and declare to be climate. So in the, in the, the title, we have the climate. And screening these funds, you find out very different approaches. So you have some of them that really just are low carbon, but they are still uh, exposed to fossil fuel and coal. Uh, other that really don't care about the controversies. So you will find out names of company that are really still exposed to very sensitive sector. And in the other part, you see uh, funds that are low, zero exposure to fossil fuel, that have a very high impact on clean technology and have no exposure to a, a specific um, a controversial company. So you see the difference. It's not that they, they all comply with the fact to be climate sensitive, but the, 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 the fundamentals are different from one fund to the other. So depending on what you are looking for, some of the funds are fine, but others really don't fit with, uh, with certain sensibility. And that's what is important. Thank you very much indeed. I, I'm being prompted by the, the chat, which um, hopefully only we can see um, that I do need to wrap up now. So to the three speakers, thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't think we're going to come to a conclusion anytime soon, but we do know that there are a lot of people out there trying to resolve the problem. And now I'll hand over to um, back to Saloni SRI.